Coming from Switzerland, we're going to have a countdown. There we go. Swiss Railways, the train is leaving. Let's close the doors. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thanks a lot for having me. I came all the way from Switzerland to uh, talk a bit about German Swiss precision tooling numbers, <laughs> all these things. My name is Alex, Alex Niehus, but I go by Alex Newton because my surname is Dutch and nobody can spell it. <laughs> we have a lot to go through, so I hope you can fasten seat belts where you sit. I will be going through a lot of data because people ask for data. We produced a couple of new things for today. Um, the data you see is from my company, Kalytics, which stands for Kindle and Analytics. But due to some trademark considerations, I dropped the Indle from the Kindle. <laughs> and without further ado, we have um, two. We'll have two presentations. This one is going to be the first one here, which will talk about market, genres, subgenres, this whole category impact thing. And we have first data on AI impact, which is also going to be very interesting. Never shown before. And uh, for those of you who like to see more, there's another session tomorrow where some of the topics will go into a little more detail. So from here, let's jump right into it. It's Vegas, baby. And to take Craig's slogan and this great location, I was the first time here back in 2018, which was great fun, Sam's Town. Um, I think the gambling hasn't changed, although many of you may feel a bit like this when they do their book project. <laughs> now, I'm not a gambler, but I know statistics. And I know there are certain games like this. There are games like blackjack and poker where you can increase the odds if you know what you're doing if you know your numbers right and that's what we're going to do today there is no silver bullet for anything but let's equip our decisions with a little bit of data to hopefully make better ones as always um, there are many paths to Rome and what works for one may not work for the other but at least let's uh, give some decision foundation to what we're doing. But to broaden the scope a bit, I wanted to show you this. Because when we talk about trends, who, who had one of these babies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They changed my life to the worse. And, <laughs> and you see, devices come and go. Now, the Kindle device was a little bit better because after this big hype, I think it was here around uh, 2011 or so, um, the device hype died down again, and now it's at about 20% of the level of where it was before. So Kindle as a device is actually doing pretty well. But trends come and go. Books come and go, genres come and go. Well, actually they don't go, but you will see some numbers. And this is important to keep in mind. Now, what is so beautiful about what we're doing um, as an author community relying on the Kindle platform is, while devices come and go, many good platforms endure. What you see here is the search interest for Spotify on Google, but also the search interest for Kindle Direct Publishing. Isn't this wild? So there was the first gold rush time, and then, you know, it faded away a bit. But then, very consistently, ever since 2017, there is a rising interest, again, in self-publishing, Kindle publishing, and you may have some hypothesis where that very recent peak comes from. I at least got five Instagram posts per day. Hey, write a book with only one click, one keyword, and you get the whole book. That obviously sparked some additional interest very recently. And also, mind you, it's been a long time, 2007 to 2011. I mean, it started as uh, originally Amazon Digital Text Platform, then it was rebranded into Kindle, I think, 2011. It's a long, long time. And a remarkable journey that was. What you have here is the number one top-selling books 
on Amazon Kindle from 2007 to 2023. And there were, by the way, only two books that made it the most selling book of the whole year. It was uh, The Girl on the Train and Handman's Tale. That was only two books that ever made this. Now, when you extend the view a bit, this is the top five for every year. You will reckon, anybody who has a title on this list? Show of hands? No, not yet. Um, many of these titles were landmark titles in laying the ground for, again, trends that endured for years, whether it's here um, Twilight, PR, The Billionaire Romance, turned obviously Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, somehow I feel the reader audience is uh, very, very pessimistic. I mean, teen, teen dystopian, teen post-apocalyptic, then adult dystopian up there. Um, finally, we get a bit like, I'm a thriller fan, so psychological th is thriller, and hopefully we have this new era of thrillers coming up, and obviously romance and sci-fi as well, and all other genres. You're right. Um, in terms of the growth numbers, Amazon does not publish any numbers pertinent to the complete revenue of Kindle. But obviously what they do do is they publish the amount of money being paid to all the authors and publishers that chose to go exclusive via the KDP Select program. S this is the Global Select Fund. I think out of these many, many months, there were only nine months where that fund was in decline. And those were always the February months except for one. So. Uh, it's going up and up, and I've, uh, we always do this projection. It's been now pretty constant, and we expect 11% growth by the year end. And I feel, well, name me one industry these days that consistently produces these double-digit type of growth numbers. Now, we know there is another side to the story, the rates, etc., and we'll talk about that in detail tomorrow. Now, here's the good news. For those of you who haven't seen this graph, the, two th the 23 numbers are not finally in yet, but this is what we counted as a market share of indie authors across all the top 30 bestseller lists based on observing some 630,000 rank observations over the years. You can give yourself a big hand. And across the bestseller list, that is bigger than the big five. It's bigger than the Amazon imprints and all the other traditional publishers. So very well done. And I think this is a complete understatement. Why do I say this? Here, this is very fresh from the press. This is the top 400 most selling Kindle books for the year 2023, year to date. Numbers are from three, four days ago. And they are from January to now. And Anybody, show of hands, who has a title here? Well, if there are people in the conference, we have a lot of titles on this chart. So, um, I mean, number one, Freda McFadden, she has 16 titles on this chart. Then there are others who also traditionally publish, of course, I, I think Megan Quinn, Colleen Hoover, um, Sarah J. Maas will be up there. But for example, our esteemed visitor, uh, Katharina Maurer, who's here at the conference, she has six, six titles on this chart. And there are many, many more. The, the, the names, you know, the Caroline Packhams, the, um, I could read you out all the names and it will be a who is who of self-publishing. And if we only count those where there is no publisher name on the book details page, these alone make up the 37, 39% that we had on the previous page. So if we look at the most sold books, I'm pretty confident we'll try to do the final numbers by the end of the conference. This could easily come out at north of 50% for the indie community. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and if you have still some friends and relatives who say, yeah, but it's only indie publishing, yeah? Indie product quality. <coughs> These are the ratings from some 43,000 titles. In the 4.5 out of 5 imprints, Amazon 4.4, you can see the numbers. 
I think nobody has to shy away. And if you look at the right-hand side, the one and two star ratings as a percent of all the ratings, well, indies have 4.8% one and two star ratings out of all other ratings, and they do better than the Amazon imprints on that matter. So whenever you get a backlash on, oh, but I'm indie, you know, uh, show that chart. Now the share of indie success varies across genres. Uh, indie success spans the big genres. These are last year's numbers, as said, 23 is not finally in yet, but in romance we had some uh, across some 117,000 titles and observations of rankings, 70% in the sci-fi, 69, teen young adults, 67, mystery thriller suspense, 47, and so on. The indie publishing community is really dominating this platform by now. Now, let's take a closer look in how some of these genres have been doing. What you see here is the numbers I collected. I started doing this um, back in 2014. I now uh, have here a timeline from 2018 onwards. And what we have is romance. My God, what happened during the lockdowns, you know? <laughs> Ladies. W were we husbands so malperformant <laughs> to... No comment. <laughs> anyway, there was a very big boost for the romance genre during the pandemic, and you see it took it as a launching pad to continue all the way. And just last month, we had the highest ever average sales rank across the top 100 titles uh, based on many observations during the month, and um, yeah, it's going up and up and up. T to block the other genres, I even have to squash the axis here a bit, and this is mystery thriller suspense. During the pandemic, then also uh, second lockdown, big hype, but then interest for thrillers cooled off a bit. Not for romance. And uh, now we're seeing a bit of a uptrending again in mystery thriller suspense. And then again, I have to squash this to plot the next biggest genre, which is sci-fi and fantasy. Now, sci-fi and fantasy, I think we have a couple of factors going on. The one is the rise off during the lockdowns, the need for uh, escapism. We have more about that later. And then a pretty continuous drop, unfortunately, for those involved in this genre uh, all the way to present time. So this whole momentum that was built up during the pandemic, unfortunately, did not entirely make it into present time. And then I have to squash the axis once again to plot teen and young adult. <laughs> now, <laughs> this has nothing to do with the lockdowns. This has to do with two major changes that Amazon made. And this will be the next probably 10, 15 minutes of the presentation where, the, where there is a very high chance of me losing you. If I do, I'm still with you. Nobody, nobody leaves the room. So, <laughs> our door is locked, Ricardo. Thank you. <laughs> so, the first change was a bit more than a year ago, September 2022. Amazon introduced this three plus bestseller list display limit. And I'll go into it in more detail in just a second of what it is and what its impact was. was. And the second one was the very recent one that all of you are aware of, the three browse category upload limit that also went hand in hand with a whole number of process changes, the self-service, you name it. Now, why? Obviously, there is a very causal relationship at this first big milestone, September 2022, when this first limit hit. And particular, in particular, it was teen young adult being hit, but you will see in a second, thousands of genres were heavily affected. And there is good and bad news about this. First of all, why did Amazon do something that you know, shakes up the system in such a big way anyway? I don't know, but I have a hypothesis. 
likely reasons. This whole bestseller list display limit that a book can only be shown now in a maximum of three categories, uh, sorry, three bestseller lists, more about that uh, in just now. This display limit, very much, I think it is around consumer experience. We had the uh, Potter Everywhere syndrome, and it very much curtailed the consumer choice because whichever bestseller list you went into, you always saw the same books, obviously. Now, on the other side, this three browse category upload limit, we had the big mess match between the back end in KDP, the BISAC upload, uh, and the storefront, which was always a mismatch, and um, huge inefficiency. I mean, when they introduced in 2017 that you could have up to 10 categories be before it was less, with a manual process, I mean, if I had been the head of that division, I would have sacked the person right away who did this. <laughs> Frankly. I mean, how can you set up a manual process with hundreds of thousands of authors and publishers out there where you then get phone calls and say, yeah, well, let me put your book into this in this category. It's co completely insane, and probably with all the tech layoffs, somebody had a closer look at whether that makes sense or not. So cost, certainly something. And the other big thing was category abuse and pollution. And we all know misplaced books, people gaming the system, and also something about consumer protection. I cannot tell you how many books I've seen with uh, children's, you know, erotica titles in the children's categories, and you don't want to go into this one. So Harry Potter syndrome was very clearly one. Just one example, the first title of Harry Potter uh, has, to the present day, by the way, in the back end, 19 categories it is registered in. And at any point in time, just Harry Potter 1 would show in 39 rankings across bestseller list, and that's title one only. So yeah, congratulations, Potter Moore Publishing. Oh, perfect. So complete visibility. That obviously now changed with this new limit. And the rank drops were not just in teen, young, adult, they were in thousands of category here. Um, science fiction, for example, in absolute terms, just look at this, the rank drop for um, classics, whoosh, minus 20,000 plus, as the average sales rank for the top 20 titles. Reason for that being that now you can click on classics. And, and finally, we see a Dune in this type of book and not some urban fantasy in, in classics, right? So a lot of these rank ranks drops. Why do they drop? Now, if a Harry Potter and a like, a high-ranking book is pushed out of the category, what remains is books that have lower ranks. So if you compute the average for the category, you come out with a lower number, and that causes this thing, which in my mind is, first of all, a very good thing because you get a much more realistic picture on what actually the sales potential of a category is. Now, what's the good news on this? F as a, first of all, I think it is good news because uh, you have a reset and you have more choice. The other one, now there are lots of numbers on this, but and this was a lot of work. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> last night I went through 19,000 available rankings, um, and before that first change, the number of unique books in the top 20 positions that you had around 19,600 available category ranking positions, top 20 ranking positions, there were about 9,000 unique books in there, sorry, yes, unique books, and uh, that is a typo, the, no the, the number of authors is very close, but it it's, uh, should be a different number of ranking authors. But the growth number is the correct one. This one will be corrected in total, you got about 27% more unique books in the bestseller lists and exposure. And you all of a sudden had an addition of, uh, top of my mind, it was more than 2,000 authors um, where, who had never seen the light of day before in c terms of bestseller ranking positions. So I think that's good news. And it also was sustained during that time. All right. I haven't lost you yet, have I? <coughs> Good. I'll give you the next challenge. The next change were the three browse categories. And here, the first thing which I guess 70% within the Amazon crew itself does not know is a bestseller list is not a browse category. 
the term is, even in the help pages, it's always used interchangeably. And it's, it's not interchangeable. The bestseller list is what you see when you go on bestsellers. It shows at any point in time 100 books, but it's not a complete catalog of books, obviously. The browse categories do show the at least the indexed part of the books. Now, on first sight, you might say that's sort of the same thing when it comes to nomenclature, but it is not. And by the way, add marketplace differences and the impact of search results on I won't go into that. makes it even more complicated. But what you need to know is there are more browse categories than there are unique bestseller lists. That is what added a whole, and still does, add a whole lot of confusion. So if for example, for the category biographies, for UK biographies, there are eight different browse, I come to the same category endpoint by going through biographies, memoirs, or through nonfiction. Here, the ratio is eight to one across the board. It's like three to one. So this may have caused all your things. So basically, if there were only eight categories, they have basically eight different aisles in the supermarket, but they have only one magazine where we say this is the highest selling items for all of those. And that adds a lot of confusion if in the help pages they talk about categories. Now, this is where I will lose you. I won't go through all of this, but what was the impact for the authors of both these changes across all various points? First of all, in the category hierarchy, we had a mismatch before, which was before between store front end and store back end. Now, unfortunately, we have this new mismatch between bestseller lists and upload categories. Ta-da! So, you know, kill one problem, create a new one. Category maximum, I think here, probably in orange for what it does. The most hit authors, by the way, were all the big hitting authors with who had like books in X number of categories ranking. Process efficiency, I would say clearly a yes, you know, it's green. But here is the next problem, human factor. You at least had some human intervention in the upload process before. So if you wanted to upload an erotica title into a historical romance category, there could still be somebody who said, ah, that, you know, doesn't make sense. Since that change in the last historical romance report we did, the number of titles that are in a erotica category have actually increased uh, have from 10 to 20 percent. So you have people who start gaming the system again by exactly not taking the adult content stuff but placing their books in there. So just as end, you know, category pollution, we saw a ten tem temporary uh, improvement. Uh, teen young adult, I think that improved at least a little with those tick marks, but Keyword interference. I still hear people contacting me, uh, but I end up in this category that way. My colleague Dave Chess and I think also did a great analysis with, yeah, there is interference from keywords, maybe hypothesis. Before 2017, you got in a, into a category by choosing a BISOC industry code category and then choosing certain keywords to force the book into a store category. Maybe, complete maybe. The manual process is abolished and something of the old algorithm may kick in so that keyword choice may um, influence where you end up. And they even write this. So here I must have lost you, but what is the good news? Now, here's something you may not know. This limit of three categories. Some people tell me, yeah, but I see a book X, Y, Z. It's not just in three categories. And you're right. What is meant by the, no, this is nowhere written in the documentation, really, um, although they say it will help you in the placement up there. If you are placed on the very right-hand side in that category ghost, automatically all those things will trigger, if your sales rank is good enough, you will also rank in all the green parent categories to that category. Some people know that, some people don't know that. It is important because people get confused, but yeah, this book has not three categories. It is three categories, but if your rank is good enough to rank in a higher up category, it will automatically do so. The next question is, yeah. Now, if I have legacy categories, like this book here has uh, seven or eight categories, and it's all the display, although it's store wide, couple of days ago in the top 100 rank 22 it's 
not displayed in those categories where it is registered in. That's the new rule. However, why does it then show in a certain browse category? And that is why I'll try to explain it's the difference between a bestseller list and a browse category. Browse category being the aisles of the supermarket. The book is still displayed in the aisle of the supermarkets. Now, this is getting a bit advanced, but if you have legacy categories, you may not want to immediately touch them because you purge that. And this is the reason why. Because what do you purge if they're not displayed anyway? It wouldn't be any advantage. But your book is still registered in those aisles of the supermarket. So if you have, as an Amazon VIP 19 categories like Pottermore Publishing, you don't want to touch that category system. All right, last not least, why is the book details page yet different? Uh -huh. we all, yeah, it's three, but those three that are shown are not the three that I've chosen or registered or am displayed in. Very simple reason for that. What is displayed on the book is not just Kindle categories. It is actually uh, a book bestseller list, a Kindle bestseller list, uh, another book bestseller list. In this case, sometimes you get a link to a prime reading bestseller list. So this is a cross-format, cross-departmental thing, and it uh, used to be very performance-based. In that part of the store where you achieved the highest ranking, that was displayed on the book. Not quite so anymore, so don't ask me what the algorithm is. But very important also, the books category the book's bestseller list is cross-format. It is not print. You have 70% of books in there that are actually e-books. So it can get confusing, but this may shed a bit of light of what has happened. It's getting really boring, I know. Let's do the fun stuff. <laughs> so categories, obviously very much an enemies to lovers affair, um, but there is also very much good news, especially, for example, for the romance people. Um, we always had the problem that there is not really the high-selling tropes as categories. This is fresh from the press because you being at the conference, you may not have noticed. September 23, they introduced the Amish, the Rockstar Romance, and ro uh, Romance in Uniform category. Uh, at that time, I made a Facebook post saying, oh, who does that? I, can, you know, I, I could name 15 other tropes that are higher in sales than Rockstar Romance, although I'm a rock star too, I, <laughs> that's where I lost my voice. And just a couple of days ago, you now have adaptations, alpha male, billionaire, millionaires, enemies to lovers, love triangle, mafia romance. These are really very high selling tropes, and I think that is good news. Whichever the categories are, and this is for the people who don't know Kalytics and uh, don't know this type of data, and then we go into trends. You know, there are so many categories, there are so many tropes, there are so many worlds you can build, so many characters you can invent. Uh, they are limitless. If we want to put numbers just based on the sales rank data and the size of categories, you could basically say every dot is a star is a category. I've been showing this the last eight years. We still use it. The further you go from here to that end, the more titles you have in a category, the more com competitive it is. The higher you go on the star to the stars, the better the sales. And all category pollution aside, obviously you can take this into a next level type of detail and also, but it gives you a starting point. And as an author, just walk away with a concept that it is a difference whether you publish, say, a domestic thriller or go into a more competitive segment such as Vigilante Justice, the uh, Jack Reaches of the world, or whether you go into a super crowded yet very high selling cozy mystery segments. The nature of competition and sales potential varies with each of these genres. And as a professional author running a business, you should be very well aware of what the sales potential, the demand is, uh, versus what the supply, the level of competition is in your genres. Now, that is a static view, one point in time. There is this other part to the equation, which is catching the wave as a writer. Now, catching the wave as, as a writer, I show this in almost every presentation, but this time I was surprised 
by it. So last year we showed it so far. And you see over a long period of time, good news is publishing is not the fashion industry. The trends are longer than it takes to publish books. It's a very good news. But this is what's happening right now. Not only, only were us husbands extremely malperformant <laughs> during the <laughs> pandemic, it also seems you completely missed the boat in terms of expectations. <laughs> so heat levels clearly on the rise. Um, this is the bestseller list for Erotica, which we all know has been heavily suppressed by the Amazon algorithm and ad limitations. Uh, and this is why it was going down. There came the before-mentioned pandemic. But I think this is not caused by husband's performance. This is caused by TikTok marketing, which completely and for the first time again opened up a channel to get these books out. And this is why the bestseller list recovered. For the tamer people amongst you, this is clean and wholesome romance. Now, also here, make no mistake, clean and wholesome romance is one of the most successful um, genres you have there on the romance platform. But it was also briefly heavily affected by many actually high-selling women's fiction authors who placed their books and marketed them as clean romance, now doubling down more on the women's fiction side and vacating these spots for others to claim. We also looked at escapism versus epic fantasy. So epic fantasy versus post-apocalyptic. I think two effects after a lockdown and war and uh, the walking dead being totally dead. <laughs> Post-apocalyptic has really been going down and people are looking for the good news. The bad news, by the way, if you're into eBooks and you do one of these courses of hey, make $10,000 a month by uploading your paleo breakfast recipe book. It ain't work. It never has, but just, this just underscores the point. Nonfiction, very much dead on the Kindle platform. We have people here at the conference who make a lot of money with nonfiction, but for this session, you should come to my next session tomorrow where we talk about formats, eBooks, other formats, uh, some interesting data on that. Yeah, those were some trends. And obviously there's the big elephant in the room. Let's talk about this next wave then. And before we actually do, let me go back to this one slide again. You will see a couple of AI impact stats, but have in the back of the mind this blue curve when it comes to nonfiction as a gauge of demand of what people actually buy. Open parent, they don't buy it. Close parent, let's look at these numbers. So we have this chap here, and when he's not surfing, he's writing books, or she for that matter, or let's not get into the pronouns, but you get the idea. And um, we look now at a couple of bestseller lists over a 10-year horizon, how many books are published every month in that specific category. You will, in a second, see a graph that goes from where I go, which is basically the year um, 2000. Uh, let's have a look at it, what it is. So 2018 in this case. This is the category self-help personal transformation. And before AI, we had roughly about, in the five years ago, say 200, 250 new titles a month in self-help coming online that gradually grew with the increase of popularity of Kindle also during those years. And then you had the first early adopters of AI, and then you have this wave of Instagram posts of make, you know, make the name one-click book. And yeah, 
This led to the effect that uh, two months ago we had more than 5,000 new self-help titles being uploaded to the platform, which is really great. I now really feel helped and <laughs> it improved my life a lot. <laughs> then, so that's what happen is happening with these typical genres as one placeholder for those genres where it's really easy for scammers to do that. Let's do the 8,000th title for Law of Attraction and that sort of nonsense. And new books, here is another one. This is sort of like between the, th uh, between the scammers and serious authors. These are romance 45 minute short reads. Also here, very clearly an effect of AI over the last couple of months. And by the same token, you know, you have here, there's always these El Dorado hype times and bulk uploads some sometimes going on. Not quite as heavy the impact. <coughs> and here we have contemporary romance. So the good news is in, I think, the, the serious writing genres, and that is not being dismissive to nonfiction at all, I think you get the idea. This is where it may not be that easy to produce a product as of now on a key press. I think the effect is contained and we also see this very little dip at the very right hand ha uh, side of the chart. So at least this new upload limit that Amazon introduced seems to have some effect. It's not like totally crashing down, but I had originally feared that this would go like exponentially up. We'll keep monitoring it and it should be monitored. Let's see what happens. Now, <coughs> towards the end of this presentation, I'm always being asked for, Alex, you know all the trends and what's gonna be the next big genre? Well, the last prediction I did at this type of conference, which was 2019, was an utter and complete fail. <laughs> <laughs> I had predicted that the underly marked, marked hell conglomerate would venture big time with their core capabilities in sci-fi into the nonfiction arena. Um, it did not work out. So I'm very, very hesitant always to make these predictions. Th the one which could happen, well, who knows? I think we have big change coming on um, through AI and the, the next conference, the news in 2024. <laughs> Isn't this a great time? You can stay at home. You know, no more getting drunk at the bar at night and stuff. You know, it's, it's so much more healthy to have these guys write the books. Now, joking aside, we, we really have to monitor the situation. Um, I think there are panels and all things on, on the AI, AI thing. I d won't utter an opinion of good or bad. I think it's the job of the researchers just to, to okay, what do the numbers say? And can we form an uh, opinion with the numbers? Whichever the case may be, as said, you're artists, the robots are not artists. And I think for an artist, the, the, the sky is literally not even a limit. And you can write and invent and be creative and do whatever you do. Don't, I showed you these numbers in, in genres such as contemporary romance, you know, don't be too afraid. I personally, and, and look at the nonfiction example, if you put this uploads, versus the sales, yeah, they upload the book, they do it once, they have zero sales, uh, and they move on. So let's stay cool, let's see what it is. For you, you, you have all the, um, all the genres, anything you can do in the world. I'd like to thank you for inviting me again. If you love this sort of stuff, you know, uh, we have research done for you. Genre reports, the big category database, many of you use us. And um, of course, you're invited to check us out if you want. Check this one out. Um, there is basically one interesting piece of content that may be relevant for you. There is a, a basic report, which is very basic. It just has the numbers on 
say romance, NTS, like um, with actually part of this video, what you're seeing, or this presentation, what you're seeing here. But the other one, we have a Christmas present there, which is the Christmas Romance Genre Seminar, which we do every year for free. And it gives you just a taste, a 45 minute, minute video, and a sample report of what our genre reports typically look like. So um, you can have a look at this one. And we even have, and th th you can still scan it up there, I hope it works. And we have time for a couple of questions, but before we go into question, thanks a lot for having had me here again, and I hope you enjoyed this. You mean live class? Oh, the next class is, is tomorrow, indeed. It is this one here. It's at 10.30. I called it Kalytics, Eight Years of Amazon Data Analysis for lack of any other title, but we're going to go into many sub uh, topics a little more detail, if, if you like these sort of analyses. Just hold on a second. Do you understand the questions? I think you need to. Let me launch the mic. Thank you. So on the, on the product sales page, it lists your three categories down below. And I've been very confused about the three categories I'm in because I used to be in Werewolf Shifters, and it's coming up with two genetic engineering ones. And if I understand what you said correctly, those are where I'm sitting on some of the bestseller lists. Is that correct? Well, because one of them, two of them are exactly the same. They're both genetic er engineering, but one says books and one says ebooks. Yeah. And then the third one, which has nothing to do with where we're shifters, it's dragons and myths, mystical. Um, Creatures is saying it's Kindle. So does that, you know, that doesn't have to do with how you would find my book. It has to do with the bestseller list. Is that correct? Well, in, in very simple terms, first you need to check out, and I think there are one or two websites there, is where you put in your ASIN and you can check in which category your book is actually registered in. That is the starting point. Then on the book page itself, it should rank if it does rank in at least one of those, then click on those links. If it takes you to books, it's Amazon's print bestseller list, but even if you don't have print, it's a cross-format one, so it can rank there. The one where you cannot make a connection, where you say, I've never put it into that category, and here it shows, that can be due to that new Amazon rule that they say they may change categories. They have a bot doing this, obviously, based on keywords or where, what other things maybe people, our hypothesis is very much that the keywords you used may force it, as in the old days, into one of these additional categories. So if you're in one of those categories and you're in the top 100, should you then double down on that? <laughs> well, if you're in the top, uh, seriously, if, if the algorithm learns that you know your book is there and you, you are among others that are also relevant to the genre, and it's a good uh, place to be in, then you know, I, I would let the algorithm learn and not change the category. Okay. All right, any other questions? Hi, Alex, thank you. Um, so my understanding of the recommendation algorithm for Amazon is that they send you an email if you like to book in a certain genre or a category, I don't know. Um, so therefore, there was a chance that your book would be recommended via email. Now that we have fewer categories that we can assign to our books, has it affected people's sales significantly because you no longer get as many recommendations to customers? I, I think there's two effects. For th the number of promotions where you might end up in to the some high-hitting authors, which were also confined in the categories, I I've heard both sides. And this comes back to this distinction between bestseller list and categories. So 
it's, it's not entirely clear yet. So what did happen though is that over a period of time, the visibility for those authors who were in a lot of categories went down. Sales briefly may have taken a dip, but guess what happened? They put other books in there and, and now they have you know, other books of the portfolio actually making it also into, into the list. So many things come back to a previous equilibrium. We have three seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think uh, Amazon can and will do going forward to prevent people from potentially flooding uh, submissions with possibly multiple different accounts if they have mass quantities of AI-generated content? Well, the one thing, very simple thing they just did is they introduced a daily limit of, what is it, three books, per, three per day that you can upload at maximum. So there is no upload at scale like I upload 1,000 things. Now, if I obviously do fake accounts, I don't know how they will monitor that, but that's obviously the next level of gaming the system, and I do hope that with these numbers, we can say, hey, you need to do something. All right. Thank you very much.